The following review contains spoilers for the film How to Train Your Dragon. I strongly recommend seeing the film before watching this review. And with that out of the way... Sorry for the formal spoiler warning, but this is one of those cases where I want to play it safe. Because the thing is, How to Train Your Dragon is one of the greatest animated films of all time. No seriously, it is that good. Now on its surface, the story doesn't feel all that remarkable. In a lot of ways, it feels downright predictable. I mean, look at what the opening sequence tells us. Dragons are stealing food and setting buildings on fire. This awkward kid wants to kill a dragon and accidentally makes everything worse. His father disapproves and tells him to get lost. There's a girl character he has a crush on. We know exactly where this is going. Dragons are actually misunderstood, kid earns father's respect, kid gets the girl, the end. I could actually understand why someone would not be impressed by the movie, because yeah, a lot of these story concepts have been done before. But How to Train Your Dragon is a triumph of nearly flawless execution of these ideas, spinning a typical coming-of-age story into something bigger and more meaningful. It is just filled with smart story decisions, introducing what are normally stock secondary characters and using them for multiple purposes. In this regard, it is an extremely efficient and economical film. Not a single scene or character is a waste of time. Heck, there are really only nine characters in the entire thing, ten including the villain. For such a big story, that's a remarkably small cast of characters. Hiccup is the character that anchors the whole film, playing the role of the awkward and misunderstood outsider of the village. And to be honest, he didn't really make a great first impression for me. Because as touched on earlier, he is exactly the kind of character we see an awful lot in these kind of films. He's that awkward kid that people just don't understand. How they don't see what a delicate flower he is. And his dad just doesn't believe in him. It's basically your typical teenage angst to the nth degree. Hiccup didn't really click for me until his first encounter with a dragon, when he discovered that he couldn't actually kill it. This is an extremely powerful scene in the film. It's also extremely relatable, the whole concept of in theory versus in practice. In theory, people believe they can do a lot of things. In practice, it's not so easy. The only thing we really knew about Hiccup at the time was that he desperately wanted to kill a dragon. Turns out he had no idea what he actually wanted. It's a good turn for such a smarty pants know-it-all character like him. Afterwards, the focus shifts heavily toward establishing his relationship with the dragon, and introducing Toothless as a character. There's a definite emphasis on giving him characteristics of domestic animals the audience can relate to. Many of the things Toothless does are extremely dog-like or cat-like, after all. He has an extremely wide range of expressions, probably more than the human characters, to be honest. When he is suspicious, he is really suspicious. When he is happy, he is really happy. When he is determined, he is really determined. His character design is fantastic, particularly how they gave him such big emotive eyes. Just the small subtle glances he gives to Hiccup are some of the funniest character moments in the whole film. The pacing is perfect during these scenes. They really take their time and make sure they don't rush things. If Toothless and Hiccup immediately become bros, it doesn't make logical sense. So they build things very gradually, starting out with anger, followed by quiet observation, followed by a gift. Toothless is curious about this weirdo kid who is visiting him, but is still ultimately aloof and distant. Eventually, after a whole lot of frolicking, Toothless finally decides to trust him. I love the fact that the writers let the final decision come down to Toothless himself, that he got to take the final step. Otherwise, it just becomes a story about man taming the beast, and kind of subverts the message of the whole thing. And maybe this scene is a little heavy-handed with the imagery, but considering the human-dragon relationship is so central to the film, I feel like they needed to underline it just a little. These scenes also do a nice job of feeding into the Harry Potter storyline back at Dragon School. Hiccup learns about dragons, Hiccup learns about dragons. Hiccup uses his knowledge of dragons to handle other dragons. Toothless's character development drives the Dragon School plot. The Dragon School's story development drives the Toothless plot. Separately, all this exposition and character development would make the movie drag. Together, both stories build naturally at the same time. Once again, a lot of smart little decisions in this movie. What I love about the Dragon School is how stealthily they sneak in the important information. On the initial viewing, this all seems like a waste of time, and just an excuse to introduce a bunch of pointless comic relief characters for the kids in the audience. You got the hotshot overachiever, the nerdy fat guy, the insecure bully, the annoying duo who are annoying. Not exactly unique characters, you know. But the fact that they're able to sneak in a corresponding dragon for each of them, without me even noticing, completely makes up for their stereotypes. I mean, one of the dragons has two heads for God's sake. 
I assume the point of all these scenes were to foreshadow all the skills needed for the finale, but in actuality, the film is stealthily sliding everything into place. Once again, no scene ends up being a waste of time. Except for maybe this one, but whatever. When a kid is hiding a dragon, this kind of joke is inevitable, I suppose. I like the decision to go with Astrid as being the main adversary for Hiccup. In a lot of other movies, it would just be the Jonah Hill bully character. With Astrid, it feels like there was a definite desire to put a strong female presence in the film, which is something that is both appreciated and refreshing. They don't really feel the need to point out that Gasp, the ace student warrior, is a girl. It's treated very matter-of-factly and casually, like why wouldn't she be better than everybody else? They're all Vikings after all. Astrid's story does eventually lead to a romance, which as we discussed, is predictable, but it's not the point of her character. Her real job is to act as a foil for Hiccup, putting him in his place when he's not taking their training seriously. Later, when everything starts hitting the fan and Hiccup goes into sulky depression mode, it's Astrid who seems to know what to do and shakes him out of it. When you have such a neurotic and indecisive protagonist like Hiccup, you generally need an Astrid character around to keep things on track. She is also responsible for one of the most beautiful sequences in the film, so there's always that going for her. Speaking of which, the visuals in this film are amazing. How to Train Your Dragon will forever be a movie I regret not seeing in the theaters, because some of the scenes are gorgeous. Not just as in having pretty things to look at, although there is a lot of that, but also in the way the film is shot. There's a certain simplicity and elegance to some of the compositions, giving the character designs time to shine. And then there's the breathtaking flight scenes, which is basically the director showing off at this point. Stuff like positioning the camera behind the dragon when he's swooping downward, or looking up at the rocks when he's passing underneath makes you feel like you're there without resorting to a cheesy fixed POV shot. Anyway, getting back to the characters again, let's talk about Gobbert. He is actually a surprisingly important character, acting as the jack-of-all-trades guy who ties everything together. He runs the Dragon School and is responsible for setting up all of that exposition. However, he is also a close confidant of Stoic and mediates the father and son story. In addition, he provides a good deal of comic relief, thanks to Craig Ferguson's wonderful vocal performance. And finally, he is a central component for one of the major themes of the film, but we'll talk about that later. The point is, Gobber is another example of how efficient and economical the film is. Why split these jobs into multiple characters when one will do? And last, but certainly not least, there's Stoic. And what can be said about Stoic? He is a character who sees a cave filled with hundreds and hundreds of dragons, and decides the best thing to do is charge right toward them with his axe. Stoic is a badass. He's a character that would be extremely easy to botch, especially since we've seen the whole disapproving father story so much. Too often films and TV shows push too far in one direction, and make the father a complete jerkass whose only hobby is being a douche. And while Stoic does do a lot of thoughtless and inconsiderate stuff, they take the time to underline his motivation and emphasize how he actually feels. For example, let's go back to the opening sequence. It establishes two things for Stoic. One, that dragons attack his village and two, that his son is a liability. So it is completely justifiable why he wants Hiccup to stay out of the way, and it is justifiable why he is so distrusting of the dragons. Even when Hiccup is trying to demonstrate otherwise, he doesn't have enough trust in his son yet to go against everything he has ever known. I think the reason Stoic succeeds as a character, though, is that he tries really, really hard. He's worried about his son's safety, but actually does let Gobber talk him into dragon school. Because when it comes down to it, he wants Hiccup to be happy. And then later, when Hiccup is actually successful, just look at how giddy and elated Stoic is about it. Sure, you could argue that he's only excited because his son is finally into stuff that he is into. But the point is that Stoic so desperately wants to connect with his son and have a relationship with him. He just doesn't know how. When they do have their big falling out and he declares he has no son, look at what the film does. He leaves the room, goes outside, and we get this moment. This is the money shot of the entire film. It only takes two seconds, is completely dialogue free, but it says everything about how painful this situation is for this character. This is not the story of a jerk ass father, it is the story about someone who is too set in his ways to actually listen. It's basically the living years of the movie. The film is really smart to have the ultimate villain be the giant dragon at the nest. I don't think it actually works if the villain is the father or some evil human character. By letting the giant dragon be the bad guy, the film can justify why the dragons are attacking the village and justify why a character like Stoic would actively hate them. Both parties have legitimate arguments. It turns the thing more into a Greek tragedy and less of a dragons good people bad morality tale. 
The climax is absolutely perfect in almost every single way, truly feeling like a culmination of everything in the movie so far. The kids get their dragons, the kids do dragon school stuff. Stoic finally wises up. They recap all the flying techniques they learned. They call back to the not-so-fireproof-on-the-inside scene from earlier. They call back to the I-did-this motif from earlier. Also, you just gestured to all of me. And to tie everything together, Hiccup loses his left foot in the battle, making him exactly the same as Toothless in the end. This ending is absolutely flawless. There is no other way this film could have ended. The entire time it has been constructing a theme about disabilities and we're hiding it in plain sight. Gobber spends the entire time waving his prosthetics around and we barely even notice them because Gobber, as a character, is not defined by his disability. It has not stopped him from being one of the most badass Vikings in the village. Toothless gets permanently injured in the movie and via technology is able to fly again. Toothless is a character that is also not defined by his disability. It has not stopped him from being the most badass dragon in the movie. I didn't really notice this theme about disabilities because Gobber and Toothless are almost never on screen together. Hiccup's injury ties everything together and makes me feel stupid for not noticing this connection. It is ultimately an uplifting message about human resolve and the wonders of technology. You don't see that many films that are about respecting and coexisting with nature, but also be able to say, hey, this technology thing is pretty cool too. It's a testament to how balanced How to Train Your Dragon truly is. It knows exactly when to pump the brakes. So when I praise the film for seemingly mundane and basic stuff like establishing characters' motivations or laying out its exposition, what I'm really praising is that they don't go overboard with this stuff. Why do a lengthy monologue about how you feel when a single glance will do? It's the classic show-don't-tell mantra of storytelling. And sure, none of these narrative concepts or themes are necessarily novel or groundbreaking or anything, but they all dovetail into each other so seamlessly and efficiently that I can't help but be in awe of it. Which is why, in this guy's humble opinion, How to Train Your Dragon is a nearly flawless film and should be celebrated as one of the greatest animated films of all time. Oh, and the sequel is pretty good too.